Okay, so I just want to give a high level idea that um, the idea uh, form of the project is that you have some key idea or you have a big idea about system, but you pick a um, very unique feature or a small part, a core part about the, the feature you're talking about and, and provide a very uh, um, simplified uh, implementation, prototype implementation to demonstrate that idea. So I kind of show some idea about, well, how do I say use a NFS, network file system, how does that work? Using a few simple programs to do that. And the, the same thing happened for homework assignment number two and homework assignment number three, is that you just create a program which is just show a, a key part of the, uh, the, um, the Google file system, how that work. Uh, that's, that's both learning and both demonstration. Okay, so that, that's actually the, the things that, that we would like to push for your final project. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about uh, ethicus, and then I'm actually going to, along the line, I'm going to make that suggestion about what are the key idea you might want, you might be able to contribute to that. So let me actually share the screen and bring the slide. So you all can uh, see my screen, right? Yes. All right, yes. thank you. Because I, I won't be able to use the whiteboard, so I'm going to uh, do a slower drawing over my, um, my PowerPoint, which is going to be slow. I haven't figured out how to, use the, um, the iPad, I hope at one point I will be able to do that. I have all the hardware, but just don't have the mm -hmm. time to learn the, the exactly how to do that. Okay, so I hope you can see the, the, the screen that this is a one perspective that's showing various pieces about ethicus project that I, I actually um, show this slide in the presentation I did in class, um, but I'm not sure whether uh, you still remember, but if you forget or you want to ask any question, please uh, just let me know. Hey, please come in. Yeah, we have somebody just came in. Yeah, it's recorded. You might want to grab any okay. chair in the back and then join us from here so you can see the screen. And then while, let me see, there is a one chair message over here. Yes, this is recorded. I thank you for reminding us. <clears throat> so this is a architecture diagram. So just let me tell you that very quickly is that we have what we call the application. The application is the one that's actually going to trigger all the action. And then the core part about ethical aware computing is that we rely on the involvement of human subjects in the computation. And, and therefore the it's, ethic is not computationally, we believe that the computer can can do an autonomous ethical decision for us. Instead, we try to support the human subject that involved in the computation and such that the human subject will receive the most essential information as balanced, as diversity as possible and such that this person will be able to make a, a ethical decision autonomously by themselves. And through this process also a person, uh, the, 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 there was a, one interesting part about this computation is that um, we think that we take this as part of education. We try to provide information and, and also the information has to be uh, as truthful as possible. I, I will give you some example about that. But, but that, that is the key element. Okay, 
in this part, I'm talking about, uh, by the way, any question about this figure uh, from remote or from any of you? By the way, this is recorded, so so you you will you will not miss the part that we already started. So so one of the things I mentioned earlier is uh, is uh, uh, say, well, what what could be a core project for you to work on? So let me tell you that this is one part which I think is important uh, as a core. Um, as you see that the the human subject is important and. Important in the sense that number one, we need somebody to do particip participation. And we need this person or the right person to actually be identified as a candidate to this competition. So we can actually talk to them, communicate with them. Um, and then they will be not only receiving the ethic engine information, but they will need to move to a certain location. I mean, give you an example. Uh, I, I, I'm drunk. By the way, uh, assuming we're living in a dormitory called Tercero. Mm -hmm. You know, Tercero is not too far away. So I'm, I'm drunk, Davis downtown, burgers and food, drink too much beer. Okay, I mm -hmm. always use beer as an example. Mm -hmm. So I want to actually be able to find somebody to, to take me home. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I want somebody to take me home, um, think about this example. I don't want to trust any random person. If any random person, I'm drunk, they might you know, do something very bad to, to me uh, unconsciously. So what I want to do is I want to find somebody who is currently in Davis downtown, but also live in Tercero, which is a student. So I know the student and I know he's also in this Davis downtown. Mm -hmm. So in, in some sense, I need to recognize, I need to actually engage those people and such that they will be able to uh, um, respond whether they want to do that. They think that, okay, it's, it's actually, I think it's ethical for me to actually help one of the UC Davis students, it's not random people. And, and then we can actually be able to do that. Let, let me actually tell you more, more interesting. We, we worry about privacy. So we actually don't believe that I want to have a service like an Uber, which is actually tracking, number one, I'm actually drunk. Number two, I'm actually a UC Davis student. Number three, I live in whatever. I mean, yes, we, we could potentially use a trustworthy service, but also can we actually do something which is different for it? So the model, it, it actually works is this, is that, we actually have a Raspberry Pi. That's actually, um, where's my Raspberry Pi? Yeah, here. We have a Raspberry Pi, look, Raspberry Pi looks like this, it's in a box. And, um, and this is actually gonna put it in Tercero. And that device in Tercero is not connected to the internet, just like this. But anybody who is actually closer to the Tercero could interact with this. So what I'm going to do, let me actually tell you that this is about multiple person. So the first person is actually, before you go to decide to go to downtown in somewhere, you might actually leave some information there to say, hey, um, I'm going downtown. Just, just put it in, in, in the Raspberry Pi in the dormitory. I'm going to the downtown and put some information. So, so now I'm another person. I'm actually downtown. I feel if I'm driving, I, I will be DUI and call by police, it's not safe anyway. Mm -hmm. So I actually, what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to want to contact this device mm -hmm. to ask for help, but guess what? Exactly. I'm not, I'm not as disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. So now I actually have to identify a person. What's your name? Grease. Yeah. G. Grease. G, just letter G. Yeah. Just letter yeah. G. Wow, okay, yeah, I need to learn your name. So interesting. So G is actually uh, in, in dormitory and you're my friend. So I actually use this computation. I actually contact you and then you actually bring your laptop in front of this device. So now I'm actually connected to this device because of you. And you actually will also decide whether you want to help. If this is a random person, you don't want to help me, but you know me we're friends. So you actually be able to get close to this and then you connect to this. By the way, this is a device for remote student. And, and then you can actually bring your phone. At that time, I'm actually go through you to make a request 
about where I am and about what kind of help I need. Okay, so this device is actually over here. And, but the thing is that assuming the other thing, Charlene, right? Charlie. Charlie, okay. Charlie is actually downtown. And she may or may not leave a, a particular message over there. But assuming, what's your name? Nihar. Nihar. Yeah. And Nihar is also one of the students in the, in the dormitory. And he walked by mm -hmm. and then he realized that, okay, there was some, some help. Your computer automatically probe you say, hey, there was some help that's mm -hmm. actually needs by Tercero community. Right. And now it's your decision whether you want to, because you actually know Charlie, mm -hmm. and then you might have a way to actually identify her as a candidate that's actually doing match. Right. So you see that it's a very small scenario, but we have to mobilize people. Mm -hmm. Some of this intentionally, because I actually move you there. And some of you just because you walk by okay, okay. and then you see that. And then there was a social network behind it because you know, Charlie. Okay, so you can see that the core part of this is just try to identify the people to move certain location. Okay, just, okay. So one of the um, uh, core implementation that we want, that, that's why you see there is a, a lot of this kind of old smartphone, we try to get undergraduate students to help us to develop some mobile apps that the mobile app will be able to talk to the, um, the, the device. Mm -hmm. But it, there is a core service is that how do I decide which person is in which GPS location? This is basically what talk about the, the connected side, not the disconnected side. And this will decide the, the, the kernel over here, ethical verification using the kernel is going to inform the, those students. So in this case, we're actually thinking they will, they might be a, so this by itself cannot be centralized. It has to be uh, um, um, a, a local server. So we're thinking there might be one server, another server which is connected is running in Tercero or running for the whole UC Davis, is community oriented. And basically all the people who are actually willing to participate, Ethicus is going to periodically share your GPS location about where I am. So there, there's a one way, of course there is a one way to do that. One way is, is actually um, for you to proactively provide the GPS location. Mm -hmm. But there is the other way that's actually possible also. It's also for safety reasons. Assuming this one, in fact, connect a, uh, connect a, uh, uh, what do I call it? Uh, a connect a camera, can do facial recognition. Mm -hmm. So when you walk by this device, the camera actually connect with your phone saying that, hey, do you want to do a check-in for, um, Alibi or for, uh, there was another service I just popped in yesterday. Um, I'll talk about that later. There was, a, there was a authentication issue. So at that time, it will ask you whether you want to, you want to check in for, uh, for uh, location verification that you have been here at this time. And that record is actually key to you. Okay, so at that time, that device actually has some knowledge about locally who are actually around. So that information might be keep it for a period of time. Maybe that information keep for eight hours. So, so that's so done by Bluetooth then? It is, it's going to be Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, Bluetooth, but the first implementation is probably going to be Wi-Fi. Okay, so okay. this one will be actually configured as a Wi-Fi base station, okay. but it ha doesn't have an internet connection okay. itself. It's, it's just a Wi-Fi base station. Okay, so then essentially you have some location. And then if I actually want something to be, to be uh, connected to people around, I can use that eight hour information to actually contact that person. Or drunk driving, that's not a good scenario. But let me tell you that why that is important. Uh, this is about uh, community safety. If you think about there is a bomber, or terrorist that's actually come in to say this building, they hijack all the people or they actually doing something or it's a mall, there's a missing child. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that's actually going on. And in that case, 
um, if you want to do this kind of broadcast to say, hey, where is the missing child? Where is that information will be leaked out easily to the, to the hijacker or to the terrorist who are, who are part of that network. That's, that's actually also watch what reporters are saying. So, so sometimes those kind of things sometimes make it make things really difficult. But this kind of system belongs to the local community. So there is a way that outsider, they might not be able to communicate where the insider that already have this connection. So there are two ways for us. So, so I will say the, the first part, if, if okay, I'll go, go to that part a little bit later, but the, the pro, let me actually talk about final project. One of the final project is just implement a system and such that allow each of the user to proactively register their GPS location at a certain time. And the thing is that then the, the other, the other uh, service is that for the, um, the application to contact them from GPS location one, ask them to move to GPS location two. Okay, GPS location one to GPS. That, that's part of just, just very simple. Uh, okay, so now the following is going to be interesting. Assuming the service I like to use involve more than two people. So two or more than two, if it's one person, you just move there, you solve the problem. But sometimes you actually need more than two people or three people even to simultaneously go to this position to actually be able to do something. So you need something like a two-phase command to make sure that you got all the people you need and they're all involved. And now this is more interesting because you want them to know they are really working with the other two people. So number one, you have to know, confirm that, okay, I'm working with the other two people, but, but where are they? You don't, you don't see them. I mean, I, I, I tell you there are two people uh, working with you, but you don't actually see them. Mm -hmm. So essentially I'm going back to the, the camera idea. So this is just an example. You can have a fake camera for your project that this camera somehow take an alibi and that alibi share with the three people only. So they actually see, okay, in, indeed, we have three people get together. Okay, we're going to do this computation. So this is, this is the whole, you, th you see that this capability is a very uh, core capability. So instead of for me to get to uh, information, which is the very static. So now we're actually using this application to get to a mobility, not just a mo mobility, but a few people potentially that in their mobility to get there. So, so, so you can think about, there was a few feature I mentioned, um, is the GPS, the movement detection. So you know, they're actually moved to this, this location. And the third one is that we might need some facial recognition if you get the consent from the user about this uh, um, uh, facial recognition and you will be able to confirm that each other. Mm -hmm. So it's a group decision for you to do that. Yeah. Um, so that that itself is is a is a you can you can think about with this you you can do a lot of things. Mm. That's actually going to be. Uh, um, I even think about this could be a, like military operation almost. Mm. <laughs> like oh we're we're actually doing something uh, kinetic or something. Yeah, but hopefully uh, CIA FBI or whatever they don't need to use this capability yet. Can you yeah. give an example of a multi-person task that you would expect? Okay. Kind of okay, so that's a good question. So um, here is a multi-person uh, scenario. Um, I'm assuming I'm a customer of Chase. It's a banking. So assuming I'm so worried about security, about my financial information. So my financial information is not online, is not uh, uh, on the internet. It's actually on a server related to uh, the Chase Bank in Davis. Maybe there is a totally private network that connected uh, the, the Chase Davis to Chase in New York. That's okay, that, that's their decision. But the only way for me to access information because I'm actually a Davis Chase branch. So I actually need to go there to access my information. 
But now assuming I'm in, uh, um, um, let's say I'm in Japan, having a business trip. I want to do something with my bank, the, the transaction. So, so now what I need to do is that I want to have a um, person that actually like uh, my wife or my uh, trusty uh, person agent that he or she will walk to the Chase Bank. And there is a Raspberry Pi, assuming this one connected to all the financial information. So that person will be here in front of this. And maybe we have a uh, facial recognition, whatever. Maybe not, maybe fingerprint, I don't know. But this person will connect over here and I will need to move to another uh, device that's actually represent uh, the, my current location and valid because the bank also want to know I'm really who I am on Wait, the remote. In Japan, you're saying? In Japan, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we both have to move this location. So that, that's actually one level of security if you have a two person, like a bank service. But there are other example, which might be uh, more complicated. You might have uh, more, than, more than two people. If we can do two, you can actually uh, increase the application or increase the security to have multiple. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a typical example. So yeah. let's say you move to the device in Japan and he goes to the branch in Davis. Beyond that, what's the next step? And how do you verify that um, um, you're right. the one that wants to do the transaction? Right. Right. So, yeah. so let's actually first, uh, um, yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a great question. So let, let's actually talk about that. So I will, uh, first, before I actually travel, assuming you're the one I trust, we already go to uh, Chase once before mm -hmm. to actually, so their, their assistant already have your information, know who you are right. and know when we're together and they already know our connection. Right. So, so you have been registered. Okay, so now you're, you're the one over there. So, the, the system actually look at you, facial recognition or whatever, they can decide that this is the right person. And when I go to uh, Chase, when I go to Japan, Japan has no Chase, mm -hmm. but Japan has, assuming has a similar system, looks like this, also disconnected. And then I will actually check in with that system and the system will issue me a, a verification. It's almost like a notary saying that I'm actually there. In right. that location with my facial recognition, but that information is not being keep somewhere else. Just give it to me, okay. and I will send it to you. And you, through you, you actually connect. To make things even more uh, 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 secure, because neither of us should be trusted. So we actually ask you to go to another one, Got it. and then we actually send to you. You connect over there. So it's like in a way, multi-person. Multi this is multi-party. Kind of Got computation, multi-party computation, so depending then, on how you set the, the- And you can choose however you want to send us the code. And then we use that code that you send us. Let's say you right. text us or email us the code. Then we can use that code at the device that we're at to verify that you're actually right. where you say you are. Okay. Right, right. So then Got we it. have a complete track record Got it. about where we are. So, so I, of course, for banking, maybe people will say this is totally inconvenient, yeah. totally inconvenient. But it's it's just a example that this computation. Um, so so here is a here is a, the the uh, the takeaway is that traditionally, the human, the person, I'm the owner. I'm the only one that's actually responsible for security for everything. If my account or my laptop, my device got compromised, mm -hmm. then assuming that is actually is gone already. So essentially here, we, we make it require more than one human being mm. has to be there, has to be verified to do the computation. And so we're trading off a lot of this kind of uh, uh, convenience, but then we can have a system, hopefully much, hopefully, I say hopefully, much harder for, uh, for people to break in. Um, especially right. cyber. Yeah. So in like a regular case, you'd usually have, let's say you're in Japan, you have your Chase mobile. This is without this. I'm saying you have your right. Chase mobile app and you want to move money from one account to another account. You can do it there, but then 
to chase server and through the internet, they have all of that information, right? Uh, but what we're trying to do here is basically avoid excess information being shared with Chase. Here you have to, to, to move money from account A to account B, you have to have a trusted third party physically doing the moving at mm -hmm. a location in Davis. That's what right. you're trying to, okay. Right, right. Okay. And also it's possible, I mean, um, that Chase actually can provide both model. Okay. So they can provide a model, which is just like what they're doing today with like a multi, you know, vector okay. authentication yeah. or whatever. Uh, but they can say certain customers information is going to be using this multi-party in human, in person uh, um, processing. Um, right. and, and I think that that is possible. That means Chase in their firewall, they actually see any information related to me. If I require this option, any, um, any uh, um, uh, information that's actually uh, related to my financial will be blocked by the firewall mm. because I don't just don't want anybody to actually go so out. So you have to like tell Chase, oh, I'm currently traveling in this week. If I use my card here, yeah. it's because of that. But this, you avoid all of that. You're basically- So, so like, yeah. like for me, I'm going to already sign up the, the my banking service. Okay. I'm either telling them only when I'm a travel or even in Davis, I don't want, I don't want my information. So, so one of the motivation about this is that no matter how secure Chase or any company develop, if you consider any kind of unknown vulnerability, you consider some of the insider, there is an insider situation which they actually go in to harvest information from inside. And this is going to be really, really uh, um, um, hard. And then it's an enormous amount of account will be, will be compromised. With this approach, I can actually potentially say without this, this in-person multi-party protocol, my information is not accessible at all, even for the people that within Chase. That's okay. actually only very, very strict case they can ask. That's, that's basically a scenario we're talking about. You're here to pick up the Raspberry Pi? Or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So let me tell you. Did I tell you I'm going to give you a smartphone as well? Yeah. Okay, all right. So just let you know that this is the Raspberry Pi. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is this is Ling Hao. He was in my ECF36B. So uh, this is the, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, video cable? Yeah. Do you have a keyboard? Uh, yeah. Okay, so you know that the keyboard is connected over here. One thing I realized, I need uh, the power okay. core. Yeah. Power core is going to be this one. It's going to be the uh, USB-C, type, -C. Okay. type C. Yeah, I hope you have one. Yeah. But if you don't have one, uh, uh, let me know. I'll which try to- Power core. What? Power. I think any will work. You, you, you turn it on and with, <laughs> with my, this one, it actually works. Okay. Yeah. This, this actually works, yeah. So the other thing, you can take this phone. This one, I already reset it. Yeah. Okay, it shouldn't have any information. This is a Nexus 6. And uh, uh, do you need a power cord? Because this is still old style using this one. Uh, this yeah, is a please. micro USB. You have micro USB? Yeah. Okay, yeah, you can take okay. this one. Okay, so let me know how, how it works. And uh, yeah, it, it, I think it's reset to the factory yeah. already. So. Uh, you should be able to set everything. And just to let you know, uh, both of this are UC Davis uh, property. So don't sell it to eBay. Or something. <laughs> yeah, sure. Just yeah, let sure. you know. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I, I, need to, I need to make sure I return back to, yeah, for, for UC Davis for surplus yeah, sure. this day. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I'm actually purchasing more of this, but um, I have another one. This, this, this two are actually exactly identical. So I'm going to give this to Akio. Okay. Okay. I'm actually, this is amazing. Have you ever seen this one? This is the first generation of Android. Mm -hmm. This, uh, um, oh yeah. And it has, I really like this yeah, phone. I used to have one like that. Uh, yeah. I really Amazon. like this, but I don't think it's too old. I don't want you to do that. <laughs> I actually want to be, I think, I don't think they run Android anymore. This is probably 10 years old. That one is, I don't know how many years old, but that's, that's, uh, um, so that are, you, are you doing this project as well? Yeah. Yeah. He's an undergraduate student. And oh, he's right, right. For that project. You're, you're still an undergraduate student, right? Yeah. 
I will yeah. graduate this year. Okay. You say you, you want to take ECS 188 next quarter? Yeah, I think. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's kind of hard to get enrolled because they have a major restriction for CSE mm. students. You're, you're not CS major? I'm CS, but they have restriction because only CSE student can enroll in pass one. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I didn't. Uh, so CS is not required. So only CS CSE is, is required to yeah. have 188. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. By the way, it's being recorded, so I shouldn't say too much. <laughs> it's your personal situation. Okay, all right. Otherwise, uh, this is, might go to YouTube anyway. Okay, all right. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you very much. And let me know what other things you need. I'm actually purchasing uh, more of the Raspberry Pi right now. Okay, just let you know. Thing how okay um any question from remote let me see who else are here so we i thought we have more we have like four or five okay anybody anybody have any question from remote uh yeah i i would like to ask a question which probably does not correspond to uh Attica os but uh, more corresponding to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, uh -huh. because I've never done that kind of development before. So oh, good. yeah, I'm kind of interested like how, uh, like, like the, the way, because uh, if we like to develop something, because I'm not an ECE student, so I'm not familiar with how, after you get a board, so you're gonna connect it to the, uh, to the possibly to the computer, and then uh, you're gonna write some kind of program to that. Mm -hmm possibly a uh, .c file and then compile it and then transfer that to the program, uh, to, to the board and then to let the board to run. Uh, like, uh, I, I'm just oh, wondering. No, no, it's, it's much easier. So Raspberry Pi is just a uh, Linux system. So let me tell you, this is the way I develop. I actually just uh, have my uh, laptop and it, it basically, I remotely just log in using SSH into the Linux box. Inside there, just a regular Linux system. So uh, we, we didn't, at least we haven't started using the hardware perspective uh, about connecting to a lot of device. Uh, but, but typically Raspberry Pi, you just connect through their USB or through their, I, I forgot how to say that, the port. You can connect a variety of sensor. And um, the, the sensor are usually supported already by the, um, the, the Linux operating system running there. And we just basically write the application level program to, uh, to utilize this. Uh, um, so, so for example, um, Raspberry Pi, you can probably use it to do, to run things like, uh, um, um, uh, yeah, GPIO. Yeah, you're exactly right. So Mathreya, you're familiar with uh, with uh, um, um, uh, Raspberry Pi hardware, I assume. Yeah, I have to figure out which pin is connected to which which one of GPIO. Um, thank you. Uh, so um, what I what I what I can do is that I just uh, um, um, if, if I want to do say for example in, in machine learning, if I want to just uh, do some kind of classification. And Raspberry Pi is probably okay. I might actually connect to another small uh, GPU type of device, but, but it's okay. But if I want to do any kind of training, it is going to be really hard. And therefore I need to have some other way to connect it to another uh, cluster of GPU. And then I can, I can actually do that. So, so in that sense, the Raspberry Pi is essentially the data collection and they can do some simple uh, classification. Uh, for example, facial recognition, they, they might actually be able to run uh, the verification for facial recognition. Yeah. Any question? Uh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, yes. The thing is that uh, this is this is also interesting as well. I'm thinking about the other. Because have you actually done things like a, a notary service? Yeah. Okay, notary. So notary is an idea is that you have to find, you have to find a person who has been authorized 
And yesterday I need to have a document which both me and my son need to sign. So we actually went to uh, Davis downtown to find a notary and then we actually just signed it. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is I'm thinking when I'm signing there is that, okay, if I can have a Raspberry Pi device looks like there and has a facial recognition, has a GPS location, and why not have that device actually seeing us facial recognition or maybe we should show our driver's license. And then we actually sign there in front of that document. And then they actually send us a like a, a certificate saying that it has done. So that that is actually a form of not exactly, but it's a cyber notary service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Right, right. And this is the same thing. One of the idea we, we look at this is we wanted to, yeah, if you need to go, I know you're busy uh, this afternoon. Yeah. It's okay. yeah. yeah. So um, the, 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 the other possibility is like a electronic voting. So today we have a two kind of voting system. One is uh, you go to the uh, voting office or voting uh, place to do that. But the other way is you can actually do like a electronic online voting, internet voting, which is Professor Matt Bisha mm -hmm. from our department. He has done extensive analysis about under what situation is safe to do that. So, so we're thinking about, well, can we actually have a, a different model between these two? So what we're thinking is, is the following. Let me actually use PowerPoint to describe this. I never actually write this down uh, in, in the PowerPoint, so I want to do it the first time. This is actually Akio's idea, uh, but he's not here yet. Oh yeah, you mentioned e-voting. Yeah, e-voting. I, I kind of choke his neck, say, Akio, you have to do this. <laughs> okay. All right, so... Um, I'm actually going to borrow this one. Oh, I'm going to share my screen. Sorry. Which course are you in Concilia? Which course are you? Which course are you? Oh, oh it's just one year. Oh, got it. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I hope you can see the screen. All right, so we have this device over here. And, and the thing is that I will call this uh, cyber voting office. Let me actually write it down. This is called cyber voting Oops. Okay. And then I'm assuming this one will have a digital camera and we'll be able to do facial recognition. A facial recognition. Okay, so now I'm the voter. Instead of going to, I mean, they're talking about in the US CGA, which is the UC Davis undergraduate student, if they want to do next voting for their president, they're actually thinking maybe we can do this as a protocol. Mm. So this student, instead of going the two way I mentioned, that this person is actually walking over here and then interact with this device, interact with this device to do the voting. So the voting, including, let me actually tell you, this is more than, uh, more complicated than this. So the voting, if I remember correctly, the first thing of course is to facial recognition. And to recognize who you are, and then to register your vote. Okay, and, and now it's important. The vote is actually in two places. The vote is actually in both, both the device and the, 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 the smartphone. Okay, that's, that's the second step. The third step, is actually, I'm actually going to send a, um, a receipt to the vote server, the voting server, which is connected to the internet. Let me actually show where is the server. Let me pull out a picture. 
uh, forget it. This is connected to the internet. Let me actually just use, uh, I will just use this blue box. Okay, so this is a server. So the idea of a server, why you, you send a receipt? Let me actually draw a line to represent this. the receipt is going to send to the server. Okay, so now the, the server will actually know that, okay, this person has vote, but he also verified that he's actually voting through a valid device. Mm -hmm. It's a valid device. And also, uh, but he doesn't know the, the content of the vote. So he knows everything except the content of the vote. But the content of the vote. Right. And, and now, once you've done this, and then the server, they do a registration, the server is going to send back another receipt to you. And actually do this. How do I arrow the other direction? Okay. So that's actually number four. The uh, receipt from the server. Okay, that's that's done. Okay, that's done. So essentially what we have is that the device has the content of your vote and you have a receipt, but actually I, I don't think you should have the vote. You only have the receipt, but not the vote. Mm -hmm. The user only have the receipt. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's like what we discussed because we, anonymous. Yeah. Right. We, we, we don't want you to be able to show mm -hmm. that, that yeah. who, who, what you, who you vote or things like that. So you actually only have the receipt, but the vote, the content is only in this, this device. Okay. So now what's going to happen is that you walk away. You have the receipt, you vote, that's it. And at the end of the day, that the voting official is going to send their employee or send uh, uh, some kind of drone to actually go to all the device to pick up the, the votes. And at that time is actually going to, you, you might have some crypto protocol. So that particular content cannot be seen by anybody until the certain time. It might be a time crypto over there. view the content. Okay, so after that, then we actually be able to be able to see you know, how many people vote and also what's the result of the vote. Okay, so that's a basic scenario. Okay, now let's see things goes wrong. So because you have a device over somewhere and uh, we don't want to have like a security guard to sit right next to it, we want, we want this to be totally uh, nobody can. So somebody actually took this device away. Somebody actually steal it. I can actually took it, took it, took this uh, this device out, and I want to influence the vote itself. Okay. So at this time, we can actually have a different kind of recovery. So number one recovery is that okay, if we think the number of votes that because we register, we know how many had been bought for this particular device that has been taken out. And therefore that we can actually say if the amount of votes on that machine will not change the result of the vote, the result of the election, then we don't worry about that. And, and the thing is we have to be transparent because the judge will look at the evidence and saying that, yeah, this, this has, uh, 20,000 votes, and this is way less than whatever 
the the difference between the the attack. Sorry, different the the vote. Well, what happened if if you actually lost a lot of this device, and the the accumulated vote is actually beyond the 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 difference? So we know we talk about a significant. So of course you can actually just just um, announce saying that okay, the, the whole election is invalid because we cannot do that, right? But the other way to do that is that because the user still have a registration, has still have a ticket and that ticket will allow them to revoke if they do that. So, so if that device is gone, then essentially I could potentially have a revoke for the, only those people got affected. I can do a revoke. Okay, so here is tricky because this will involve law because whether the, the decision should be a partial revolt or a, a, uh, a uh, com or just a complete, that's actually jurisdiction. They have to decide what they want to do. But the technology actually provides evidence whether the vote, the, the voting, the whole process is valid. Yeah. Question. So sure. That first blue arrow at the top, you're sending your vote to the server, right? But the not, not, not the vote to the, the server. Not there. Okay. The, the, the vote is over here. And um, then it will not be collected until the end. You have to physically come and collect. Right. And this is actually going just to tell the server that register that I am actually in front of the real device. Sorry, it's an identity verification. Identity, mm -hmm. not only identity, I want to know if that machine is actually from the voting office. Okay, okay. Because it could be somebody actually fake one and they're collecting the vote, but that's not a, a, a uh, uh, valid um, 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 Raspberry Pi. I mean, I just put lots of Raspberry Pi around that. I and mean, how do you know that that Raspberry Pi? So that Raspberry Pi contains some kind of public key to be able to authenticate, this is actually the, the machine that's actually from the right. voting office. Yeah. So then you can uh, double check with the receipt that the server versus right. what's on the Raspberry Pi to right. correlate that this is a real device. Right, this is a real device and my vote has been recorded in both Raspberry Pi and by Would the server. Would you get your receipt back? Right, okay. right. And, and the reason we don't want to send the content is actually we don't want the server, what happened if the server get compromised mm -hmm. in a way that the server already actually seeing the, the partial result of the vote? I mean, that, that's, that's, that's why we try to mimicking the behavior, just like the, the totally in-person voting. We want the mimicking over there. And we want to make sure the box cannot open until, uh, until the whole thing is over. I mean, there is a possibility that, um, so, so this, this is actually debatable, a little bit uh, uh, controversial. If you want to actually trust this server, you want to actually collect the vote and then just basically, instead of store the votes here, you sort the vote here and then without any trouble, I think that might be okay. That might be okay. Here is a tiny little difference is that, this server itself might be under attack. I might do a denial of service attack. Mm -hmm. And such that this server, number one, it might not be available for a long period of time. And the second thing is that um, people might figure out what are the limited server that I need to attack from the cyber side. But if I actually try to keep the most important content in this device, then the only way for you to attack me is a physical. You have to go to that Raspberry Pi, remove it, or try to compromise in that. And even if you've done that, you actually only compromise one not all device, not all of them. So it's, it's just thinking. Um, um, and remember, I actually do facial recognition. So this thing is, I can potentially know who is actually doing that. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is thinking is prevent, I mean, I'm sorry to use uh, this example again, is that it really prevents some, some people from remote, even international, mm -hmm. try to compromise the domestic voting. But the Raspberry Pi is also connected to the internet, right? No, it's there or not. So how is it? Okay. They're, they're, they're not connected to the internet. So all the facial recognition before I install has to be 
uh, already preloaded, like mm -hmm. your facial recognition, like your credential, because for example, this is a Wake, uh, sorry, not Wake County, I'm still in North Carolina. This is Euro <laughs> County. And, and in the Euro County that I, I will need to have some kind of information like your driver's license to load it to each of this device so they can actually do some kind of hash check. So it's like a private network that's not connected to the internet. This is, yes, is not only private network, it, it actually don't connect to anything except not when, the not to the server. It's only connect to the server when you are closer. So you're holding a phone, which has a 5G. At that time, this and this one, they can connect. But if you don't vote, then that device is totally disconnected. So they connect through your phone? Through your phone, yes, so exactly. So you connect to the device and your phone connects to the right. server. But the design okay. could be, the design is whether you connect, you allow this two to connect in layer three, or you actually only allow them to connect layer seven. So the difference is that layer seven is easy. Layer three is actually a, a problem. There's a window of vulnerability. You don't know what they're, what they're doing in layer three. But layer seven saying that I only communicate the information about a certificate, a JSON or whatever information you'll connect to that. Okay, okay that makes more sense. Yeah. If you're connected to the phone, that makes sense. Another, right. the, one question I had originally was that what, how do you confirm that the receipt you're getting back is like a correct receipt? What if someone replicates this entire network and you go right. to a mm -hmm. fake device right. and you get a receipt, but it's not an actual voting receipt. It's right. a completely fake. You right. would have the public key of the device though, right? Yeah. You should have you, the public you, key of the device. You probably yeah, yeah. need also the, the some kind of public key for the for the, uh, vote, the voting official. Okay. Uh, you know that there, there is certificate can be used to do that. So, so the whole architecture is actually looks like this. That's why I, the whole architecture is, is assuming this one is standalone mm -hmm. internetless device. So we, we kind of change the internet. We, we purposely make um, certain device peripheral and the only way they can actually connect to this part is you have a human being. Right. So it means that human being become essential in that computation. That's why we talk about mobility, human mobility, because it's, it's necessary for those people to be involved, mm -hmm. to actually move closer in order for the computation to be uh, um, um, available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But by, by doing this, in fact, there is multiple advantage. The advantage we haven't talked too much uh, in this session is privacy. Because all the information you have, like uh, you're doing facial recognition, you're doing your motion detection sensor, whatever, those information is gonna keep between you and the device. And the yellow is will not be able to collect those. And that, that's actually very important. That's, that's essentially, when we think about this, when we, a few of us think about this architecture. We really think about, we don't want to do what Google is doing, essentially, or Big Brother or any kind of surveillance system, because the, 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 the paradigm today is called uh, IoT or AIoT. Have you heard about AIoT? There's artificial intelligence and IoT together. What does that mean? IoT collect all the information and AI is analyzing information to actually do a lot of things, but that, means our privacy is actually get compromised and then we're getting the recommendation, meaning that we're getting the influence by a machine to do something. And which is, which is we try to do a little bit of balance because Charlie know that this is a, um, a very important about ethic is that we want individual person to have their autonomous decision. Means that I want to collect the information that's actually for me to make a, but if you only give me the recommendation, then I will just, just say, oh, this is the best restaurant. I will go there. But for certain issues, that might not be a good model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we use this for, um, for smart fridge as well. Think about smart fridge. This is your smart fridge is collecting you and your family's information about how you share food. Mm -hmm. But that information is going to, this device is going to store at your home and nobody else can touch it. Mm -hmm. And when you go to the supermarket, 
you actually use your phone to actually download the information. And that information will bring with you to Safeway. And then you interact with the local machine to actually decide whether you will get a coupon. I don't know if you remember, I, I gave that example about the, recommendations, right? right, you decide, you actually need to provide some information no, and the no, store no. decide whether they want to do that. So it's the same paradigm. The information go with the owner of the information. So you have to, let's say you have a smart fridge, you physically have to go to the smart fridge and download that information before right. you go to the grocery store. Right. Like currently I think Samsung has a fridge where you can see, if you're in the grocery store, you can see what's inside your right. fridge. So you won't be able to do that, but the fridge is completely, isolated from any yes okay. yes it's like well you can still see your fridge because it's just like a banking model i can actually ask uh say my family member to that, ask, hey, can you, you go that? there yeah, yeah. we have two people and we can get the information so so the the thing is that we don't want anybody including samsung or any company to be able to just look at the, our information 24 7 data, yeah, yeah. yeah we want to say we control and we that have is, information. Right, yeah. right. And that's 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 the um the it's a tiny difference, but it actually potentially protect our privacy yeah, in a in a in a, sure. in a better setting. So and, mainly not sharing the data, it's more about keeping the data of localized right. the device, right? It's, yeah. Right. It's it's localized over there, also the data is being collected by myself. Right. So, so the thing is that um, I'm actually thinking um, there, there, there need to be an independent third party. So, so once the data in my phone, because my phone can only host so much data. So at some point I need to actually upload my, my own data to the cloud. But when I upload, I'm still in control. So I can potentially do uh, split my data into five parts, one, two, AWS, one to Google Cloud, one to something. So there's no one single point of failure yeah, yeah, in that yeah. process. Yeah, we can do that. That's certainly another file system somebody can develop and such that um, I can actually build a virtualized cloud over a bunch of cloud. So this is a personal cloud, but on top of variety of storage uh, system, which make, uh, none of the, any one of them can actually be able to control all my data. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the other thing which I mentioned is that um, today's internet make us really connected, really physically. It's a, the, we're cyberly connected in such that we can still do encryption, a lot of things to, to protect ourselves. But once that um, cyber, if, if the, all the cyber is belong to one company, then um, the, the uh, technology such as uh, quantum um, uh, computing, the technology means that the, the encryption is, can be broken mm -hmm. um, uh, very, very soon, actually, I think, mm -hmm. uh, based on the technology progress. And so if I actually put my one single player, I'm actually in a disadvantage. So, so I'm actually thinking we should really leverage the, the uh, diversity in the service market and split the data ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so which protect us a little bit more in that, in that perspective, yeah. Okay. Hey, any, okay. I want to actually talk a little bit different things here. Hold on, let me see. Any question from remote? Okay, um, I want to say that I, I gave an example about the core service, but also as a final project, you can actually develop a application that's based on the hypothetical core service to do some um, um, uh, higher level uh, application. For example, um, you can probably develop a, just example, the, the scenario of the voting. Mm -hmm. about how you're going to do the voting, then you can, I'm not sure I can get the rest of reply to all of you ready, but you can actually just say homework assignment number one client is a voter, homework assignment number one server is whatever to actually mimicking that scenario. 
or you want to do a, a like a, we, we talk about a smart fridge example. I can actually tell you, I already have some implementation for like uh, some base model for how do you distribute a coupon to whatever person and check. And uh, the thing is that that is more in the application level that you can think about what application you would like to develop that for this kind of scenario. Yeah. Can you say um, like based on a hypothetical, like to what extent are we, like if we have an idea for like the voting example, if we have an idea for a, like a different concept, like to what extent do we need to develop something like is, is just like the explaining the concepts and how like that's not enough like we actually right. need to develop something okay good good question uh charlie so let me give an example what do i mean by uh hypothetical mm -hmm. um so for example in order for me to do a voting i need to have say uh, a camera to do facial recognition to have a complete solution so i might be able to develop a prototype it's just hypothetically i have a camera there but i actually don't have it. right so just application scenario will assume that you enter one that means okay that's your face mm -hmm. enter two that's not so that that's kind of simplify okay. some of the hardware feature okay yeah by the way um having a facial recognition is actually not that hard actually the hardware the the camera i'm actually trying to put it together because it's so cool to have some of that uh, feature mm -hmm. yeah so the other, let me actually talk about the other interesting application that's in this process. So um, one of the feature that uh, student and I talk about is like a rescue mission in say Yosemite or in the desert in Arizona between Arizona and uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it's basically it's area that you don't have infrastructure. You don't have an infrastructure and such that you don't have 5G, 6G network. But what you can do is you can place a few of this Raspberry Pi with solar power, just put it there. And for example, in the Yosemite area that we actually be able to see, okay, we missed one person. He walked this by. And then remember we have this uh, a, a check-in, the, the, if we place this, we actually have a check-in, like a, your, your, your facial recognition, if you're willing to check in. So the ranger, when they want to save you, they actually can actually go over here and then try to see, are you actually probably go this direction or that direction? Mm -hmm. So that, that is a one type of vacation. That's rescue mission, that's easy. So I always like controversial example. Mm -hmm. um, but in the in the uh, the border between U.S. and Mexico, assuming there are people coming in, they're they're want to escape from them. That for them is actually quite tricky, because what happened if the either law enforcement or or cartel try to actually hurt them? They want to use this information to actually be able to track. So we're we're actually thinking about. If you want to do that, if you before you actually enter this area, and let me just use an example that assuming I already have a cousin or friend, assuming I'm from Mexico or from somewhere I want to enter, and then I actually already inform this person in US that's saying that I'm coming in. So essentially only that person, just like I access my bank information, only that person with his approval and with the, the law enforcement or whatever is actually together, they both agree, then they can access the information for, to, to see where I am to rescue me. So that, that is actually kind of a little bit twist into that. Uh, but that, that's why sometimes you need multi-party. It's, it's really multi-party is provide some kind of trust and don't, necessary have a one single party can actually control the whole thing. You want to have the, the, the user from the client side, they will be able to specify under what condition that my information can be used, even for the purpose of rescue me. 
Mm -hmm. Some of them say, I'd rather die to be, uh, to get into the trouble that I might get into. <laughs> <clears throat> it will be really interesting that, that that's how, how that will do in, in, the, in the rescue mission under that kind of constraint. Yeah, the humanity consideration mm -hmm. and, and uh, um, um, other, yeah. There's another layer too. It's like time-based, like how fast you would get to somebody or like how much time would you let pass before? Right. Yeah, it's tricky. Right, yeah. So for, for this kind of drone, for rescue mission, we're actually thinking, we're going to um, usually now this state drum is very, very useful. So we're mm -hmm. actually going to send it to collect the information. So, uh, but that's why it's important because if we only rely, rely on this kind of autonomous vehicle um, or flight, um, this become fully automatic. Mm -hmm. So that's why multi-party means that I have a, another part of the world, I have to have a human being to actually be concurrently join this operation. Mm -hmm. So then I will be able to have some control by the human being. Essentially where the whole system, the whole idea is saying that um, if you want to compromise the whole uh, application, the value, you pretty much has to compromise the basic value of human's ethic decision. That's what we hope to mm -hmm. be able to accomplish. Okay, any question from remote? Remote is kind of quiet because in person, we have a lot of interesting discussion here. Anybody? Okay, so um, anything we should talk about or from here or from all of you? Are you, do you have a group already? Let me ask, who, who, who already uh, found their partner for a group? So you already have it? Mm -hmm. So you, already, you all have a group. How about uh, uh, the remote student? Uh, are you all in a group uh, for this project or you're, you're still looking for a partner? And maybe you can actually uh, connect right now in the Zoom session. I have a group. Okay, okay. The three I already have a group. How about uh, Praktiha, Ming, and uh, Naveen, and Usain? Yeah, Professor, even I have a group already. Okay. Uh, me too. Okay, good. How about, okay, Ming has a group. Okay, all of you have a group. Great, great. But yesterday, there are students talking to me say they, they don't have a group. Okay, so I, I want to propose the, 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 this, if you have any, uh, today is my introduction. I'll be happy to, uh, to do this at the same time next week to kind of, uh, for us to continue. Uh, whatever I have any new development on my part, I will be able to share with all of you. Would that be okay? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, uh, in that case, I'm gonna turn off uh, the uh, recording and then uh, end the session right here, okay? Thanks. All right, thank you so much. All right, thank you for your interest and talk to you later.